grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So, did Jesus have like a bad day or something? Maybe he woke up with a headache that morning. Maybe the excessive, excessive desert heat finally got to him. Or maybe he was just totally frustrated with the constant bickering he had to endure from those Pharisees. I, I don't know. I, I really don't have a good reason to explain Jesus' behavior in today's gospel reading. I mean, it's just so not like him, right? <laughs> to treat that woman the way he does. For, for the longest time, he ignores her. Th then he says his message is only for the Jewish people and she should stop bothering him. She's not Jewish. She's not part of the in-crowd. Then he calls her a dog. I mean, this is just not the gentle and patient and always friendly Jesus that we meet the rest of the time. If you ask me, I think it was probably the Pharisees' fault. Jesus is so fed up with them and their criticism that he just snaps at the woman. Today, we'd call that displaced anger. <laughs> and we've all done it when we snapped at the spouse or the kids just because some idiot got to us at work. Am I right? Are you with me? Now, the reason I think it must have been the Pharisees' fault is because in our reading today, Jesus is in the middle of an argument with them yet again. We didn't actually read that part, but right before today's gospel lesson, the Pharisees and the scribes come from Jerusalem. They come to Jesus and they have this to say. Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands before they eat. Now to be sure, washing your hands before you eat is a good thing. They have a point. Wash your hands. Wear your mask. Keep the distance. We hear this refrain all day long and washing your hands 27 times in any 30-minute period is deemed essential to defeating the deadly coronavirus. So, so don't hear me say you shouldn't wash your hands. And Jesus isn't saying that really either. But, but remember the Jewish, the, the Pharisees are a Jewish sect for whom the observance of the law of Moses is the ultimate goal of all religion. Now, to be sure, they don't represent all of Judaism by any means. In, in fact, they are a decided minority within the synagogue community, and often they are in conflict, not just with Jesus, but with the temple authorities and with the mainstream Jewish leaders. You could think of the Pharisees as the holier-than-thou people because they insisted that the law of Moses was to be kept at all costs and in minute detail, and to them, keeping ritually clean was the most important thing of all. No eating prohibited foods, no working on the Sabbath, no wearing garments made of different fabrics, Yes, I know, I never understood that one either. No eating with Gentiles and sinners or with anything other than good Jews who have kept themselves clean. No violation of any kind of the 614 laws and regulations found in the Old Testament. So you see, in this story, Jesus drives the Pharisees nuts as usual, <laughs> because he violates what they consider their holy and unbreakable law, which includes washing your hands before dinner. Except this really isn't about washing your hands. The Pharisees are just using this latest infraction of the disciples to snipe at Jesus once again and to accuse them of ignoring, did you catch that? The tradition of the elders, that's how they put it the tradition of the elders, and breaking the law of Moses, which, truth be told, Jesus is doing, totally. <laughs> because for Jesus, the ultimate measure of a religious life is not how clean you are, 
and how many regulations you follow and how many boxes you can check off. That's not what religion is about for Jesus. For Jesus, the ultimate measure of a religious life is how loving you are. You see, in all that Jesus does, in all that Jesus says, every argument he has with the religious leaders of the day, he makes it clear that the purity laws no longer have sway over the faithful. That's why these Pharisees get so annoyed with him, because he literally threatens all of their teaching and their traditions and their faith practices and their very way of life. Jesus replaces the purity laws, the law of Moses and of the Jewish Bible, with the law of love, God's law. And from now on, it's no longer about how ritually clean and pure you are. It's about how much you love God and your neighbor. That makes sense? You still with me? That's why Jesus says when he is asked what the most important commandment is, you remember this, what does he say? Yes, he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says these two commandments are one and the same, really. Because you can't love God if you don't love the neighbor. And in loving the neighbor, you love the God inside of them. See, that's the heart of the Jesus religion. And it's really important for you to remember this, so say that with me. You can't love God if you don't love the neighbor. And in loving the neighbor, you love the God inside them. Love is the new yardstick of Jesus' teaching, not ritual cleanliness. Which is why his encounter with the woman <laughs> is even more puzzling. He doesn't seem to love her at all. And neither do the disciples who tell him to send her away because she's annoying them. Now, this woman is from Cana. That is, she's a descendant of Ham. Remember back in the Old Testament, that's the guy who was cursed by Noah because he saw his father naked? Big deal. So this woman hails from the region of Tyre and Sidon. Matthew makes sure to tell us. She is a Canaanite. That means she's a pagan. Someone who worships not the God of Israel, but the Phoenician gods. In fact, in the Gospel of Mark, she is called the Syro-Phoenician woman. And so Jesus and his disciples at first totally ignore her. Maybe the same way that, you know, today we ignore an, a really insistent beggar who, in the street who asks us for money and we pretend that he ain't there. But she won't have any of that. She starts shouting. <laughs> Actually, in Greek, in the original, it says she started screeching in a loud voice, right? Because she's persistent. She loves her daughter who is in trouble and she will be heard come what might. Last week, the presumptive Democratic presidential candidate, Joe Biden, finally revealed his choice of a running mate. Kamala Harris, senator from California, joins the ticket as the candidate for vice president, first black woman to be on the ticket of any one of the major parties. The political commentators I listened to on all sides of the spectrum made a big deal of this fact. First black woman ever to be on the ticket. And I don't know about you, wherever you stand politically and you know whether you're gonna vote for her or not, uh, whatever camp you're in, I, I think we can all agree that in our society for far too long, Women have been silenced and ignored and pushed to the margin just like they were in the patriarchal society of Jesus' day and ever since. It was, after all, only a hundred years ago that women finally got the vote. Actually, did you know this? The 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution that established women's suffrage went into effect on August 18, 1920 a hundred years ago, almost to the day. 
And as you can see in this photo, church women took a stand and helped to make women's suffrage a reality. That anniversary is coming up this Tuesday. And it reminds us of the long and costly struggle that women had to endure to finally be counted as equal when it comes to voting. Yet in any other way, many other ways, women to this day are still not equal. For example, women make about 80% for every dollar a man gets for doing the same job. So yes, having a woman on a major party presidential ticket for only the third time in history and having a woman of color for the first time, that is a big deal because women have been silenced and sidelined for far too long. And as it turns out, even Jesus does that today. But in this story, the, the Canaanite woman who is the wrong gender and the wrong race and the wrong religion just refuses to be silenced, just like those courageous women's rights suffragists did in the early part of the last century. She refuses to be ignored. And so she, she screeches at the top of her lungs, making such a nuisance of herself that Jesus finally can't ignore her anymore. He wants to send her away, just like the disciples who say, send her away, she's getting on our nerves, get rid of her. And then Jesus says, I was sent only to the last sheep of Israel. <laughs> implying that he's got nothing for this woman who is, after all, not part of Israel. But you know, that's a very curious reaction as well. Because if you pay attention, you can see that the woman actually acknowledges Jesus as the Jewish Messiah, right? She calls him Lord and son of David, recognizing him for what he is and for who he is, even though she is not part of the Jewish religious community. She understands more than the good Jewish people do, and even some of the disciples aren't quite there yet to recognize who Jesus is, but she does. And then there's another curious detail. This woman, this Canaanite, is part of Jesus' bloodline. Did you know that? Are you surprised? I was. I hadn't realized that either. But in the genealogy of Jesus that opens Matthew's gospel, there are three women listed that are also Canaanite. Tamar, who pretends to be a prostitute so she can become pregnant by the man she wants to marry. Rahab, the woman of the night, as she is called, who helps the Israelites capture Jericho. And Ruth, the Moabite, who married into the Hebrew family. They are listed in Matthew 1 as ancestors of Jesus himself. So by at first rejecting the loudly screeching Canaanite woman, Jesus actually rejects his own kin. They are, you could say, cousins, you know, many times removed, but cousins connected by a common ancestry, which makes it even more strange that Jesus would not acknowledge her at first. And when he says that he's only been sent to the lost sheep of Israel, well, isn't she a lost sheep of Israel if she, in fact, is part of that long line of that ancestry? Well, here's, one of how, here's how one of the commentators puts it. Her name is Mitzi Smith. She teaches New Testament at Columbia Theological Seminary in Decatur, Georgia. She writes, The fact that her people's blood runs through Jesus' veins and that his people and that his people's blood runs through her veins does not move Jesus. And she asks, if our common humanity, our relatedness does not move us, what will? And then she answers her own question. She says, the Canaanite woman persists. Like Sojourner Truth, Rosa Parks, Susan B. Anthony and others, the Canaanite woman persisted. 
She didn't go away. She won't be dismissed. She draws closer and kneels, and in the vernacular of a determined woman, she cries, Master, help me. Still isn't making a difference, though, because now Jesus goes even a step further and calls her a dog. <laughs> but even then, she won't quit. And she says to him, well, if I'm a dog, so be it. But even the dogs get the crumbs that fall off the table. And only then Jesus relents. And the woman's daughter is healed. And in the end, he praises the woman's great faith and lifts her up as an example to the chagrin of the Pharisees. The lesson for us, of course, is that ultimately, ultimately the teachings of Jesus call us to welcome and to accept all people, not just the in crowd. Even Jesus himself learns from this story that his message isn't just for Israel after all, but for the whole world. The second thing we take away from this is that faith and persistence are a powerful combination. I mean, is there anything, is there anything that we can learn from the women's suffragist movement that teaches us that faith and persistence is a powerful combination? If there's anything that the civil rights movement teaches us, if there's anything that the Me Too movement teaches us, if there's anything that the Black Lives Matter movement can teach us, it is that change, meaningful social change, does not come without persistence, but that with persistence and faith, there's a better world to be had. Faith and persistent are a powerful combination. Say that with me. Faith and persistence are a powerful combination. Perhaps this lesson from today's gospel is more timely now than ever. We're in the midst of a deadly pandemic that has changed all of our lives in ways no one could have imagined even six months ago with no sight in end. We are approaching a contentious election that will bring divisiveness and hyper-partisanship and plain old nasty campaigning to a whole new level. We are witnessing civil unrest and protests and even riots in the wake of the murder of George Floyd. And if all of that wasn't drama enough for us here in North Carolina, last week we had first a hurricane and then an earthquake. On top of all that, I mean, can 2020 get any worse? But see, see, that's where the hope of the gospel comes in. Faith and persistence will see us through the best of times and the worst of times. If the Canaanite woman can teach us anything, it is that deep faith and persistent engagement can carry the day. Faith and persistence, faith and persistence, faith and persistence. The prophet Isaiah in the first lesson today told us the same thing. He says, maintain justice. Maintain justice and do what is right even in the worst of days. Because for soon God's salvation will come and God's deliverance will be revealed. So, Hang in there, people of God. Hang in there in the faith of pestilence and partisanship and racial injustice and even hurricanes and earthquakes. Hang in there. Have faith and be persistent. Hang in there, people of God, because God's salvation will come and God's deliverance is at hand. And that, my siblings in Christ, is the good news for you today. And to that, let the people of God say, Amen.